The door slammed shut. For the third time this week, I'm age six and they're arguing, shouting about money. Mum insists that we save everything once the bills are paid and Dad chooses to spend again and again. Now, I know I'm not alone. More than 40% of couples confess to arguing about money at least once a month. And as many as a quarter of couples confess to arguing about money at least once a week. So it's clear where my family lie on that scale. But no, I'm not here for therapy. My childhood was happy and loving and wonderful, albeit full of every financial disagreement under the sun. The creation of this story and the development of a money mindset begins at an early age. And by the age of seven, believe it or not, many fundamental beliefs and attitudes about money have already taken root. Throughout my childhood, my relationship with money ebbed and flowed. It was unstable to say the least. By the age of 13, in my view, I'd basically blagged my way into a private school via bursaries and scholarships. And I spent the next few years trying to figure out if I even deserved to be there, let alone constantly questioning how the hell these people around me made all of this money. Let's acknowledge here that for teenage me, talking about money was always accompanied by emotions of fear and guilt, envy and vulnerability, let alone be enshrouded in shame. Emotions which probably resonate with many, but often actualize in the blaming and shaming cycle throughout financial disagreements. Furthermore, research shows that even the smallest conversations about money can trigger stress and anxiety, leading to actual physiological responses, such as increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increasing cortisol levels, and even sweaty palms. So I can only apologize if some of you are feeling your heart rate begin to rise. Back to my money story, it's now 2008, I'm age 15, and I'm watching my newly redundant mum spend hours on Amazon, visiting the post office approximately 50 times a day, and packing parcels of orders through the night with my dad. I will never forget the sound of that brown screeching parcel tape. My parents had, maybe accidentally, built a really lucrative business from what seemed like a series of unfortunate events. And so landed my first real experience of seeing money being made. Ignoring the fact that my brother sold chocolate bars on the school playground, this wasn't the traditional going to work and trading time and skill for money. This was something else. It was entrepreneurial, selling stuff to a starving crowd for more than the price you bought it for. So suddenly I was surrounded with a new language of money at home, investments, Costs, profit, fees, and stock. Lots of stock. Meanwhile, my brother, age 19, in between avoiding doing his homework and being excluded from school, taught himself all about property and convinced my amazing builder dad to buy a house, renovate it, and rent it out. I, however, never had any control over my finances. My mum took control and I let her, building me savings accounts and spending accounts. Throughout university, I didn't know what ICEs were or mortgage rates, savings rates, interest rates. I just tried to take a balanced approach between my mum's spending habits on one hand and my dad's at the other. And eventually, following in my now property investor family footsteps, I bought my first buy-to-let house, basically out of pure FOMO, and started to realise that maybe my mum was right. Maybe my money could make more money, and maybe I could do some investing outside of work. Since then, I've taught myself all about money and how and why, if you leave it alone, it actually grows. I've joined entrepreneurial courses and networking events, found money mentors and invested more and more. I've owned up to my money story and the beliefs I had and how they impacted me. So what's the point? Why am I stood here? And why do I think I should be sharing this message? I think it's important to realize that the money mindset developed during childhood is not fixed. It can evolve and be influenced by ongoing experiences, personal reflection and education. However, the early years do serve as a crucial foundation, shaping the lens through which individuals perceive and engage with money. I really do think that as children are in their lower school years, we should be introducing concepts such as delay gratification and patience, maybe through role play or games. As they progress through their primary school years, we should be introducing things like budgeting and the value of compounding interest and investing, because these are skills which extend beyond personal finance. They are life skills let alone be in the cornerstone of responsible citizenship. As students progress through sixth form and college, we should be telling them how to manage their money, what a bill looks like, how to pay them and prioritise them, and maybe even the good and bad types of debt. Equipping people with this knowledge is essential for fostering a healthy relationship with money throughout people's lives, free from the fear and shame that can hinder financial well-being. And young people really do want this. 
This year, research shows that 82% of young people want to know more about money and finance in school, which is even 10% more than last year. And it seems more than coincidental that the number of children engaging in uncensored financial education content on TikTok is rocketing, with some accounts of financial influencers having more than 1 million followers. So should we really be leaving it to the influencers to teach the next generation about money? Financial literacy should not be a luxury or something left to chance that you may or may not be taught by your parents like me or misinformed on like many in the audience by TikTok, but the necessity for a well-rounded development of the next generation. So that's where I'm putting my energies. And for those of you who still have sweaty palms, you can relax. We've reached the end of my TEDx talk. Woo!